Welcome back to Harbour Unboxed. For today's video, we are looking into which one of AMD's new Ryzen 5 6-core CPUs you should buy, assuming you're in the market for a new CPU price between $200 and $250 US. Now, I realize that for some of you, the answer might seem obvious, and I did suggest in my day one coverage, just a few days ago now, that you should in fact buy the plain non-X 1600 model. Unfortunately, I didn't have a 1600 chip on hand for our release day coverage, so I couldn't go into too much detail or speak from experience. I just assumed based on what we had seen with Ryzen 7, that the 1600 would overclock nearly as well as the 1600X. Therefore, in terms of performance, the 1600X and 1600 should be very evenly matched. The advantage of the 1600 being that it comes bundled with a 95 watt cooler, known as the Wraith Spire, while the 1600X doesn't come with a cooler at all. So once you factor in the cost of a basic air cooler for the 1600X model, the non-X version is more like 20% cheaper, and out of the box it shouldn't be more than 10% slower, worst case. So what makes the 1600X X rated? The answer? XFR, or if you like to drive people crazy, refer to it as extended frequency range every chance you get. Essentially, XFR is a beefed up version of the standard turbo frequency feature. Basically, various limiters such as power, current, and thermals are all in within acceptable ranges. The CPU will overclock itself a little harder. This is a feature that is enabled on the X model CPUs by default. Ironically, one way to disable XFR is to manually overclock the CPU, but I'll discuss that a bit more in a moment. The 1600X features a base clock speed of 3.6 GHz, a boost clock of 4 GHz, and a maximum XFR boost speed of 4.1 GHz. That said, those figures on their own are a little misleading. The boost frequencies, for example, only allow the 1600X to hit 4 to 4.1 GHz for single thread workloads. For multi-threaded workloads, the CPU won't actually boost higher than 3.7 GHz, so a mere 3% increase over the base frequency. The 1600, on the other hand, operates at a base clock frequency of just 3.2 GHz and is advertised to boost as high as 3.6 GHz, though again that boost frequency will only be achieved when taxing a single core. I mentioned that the advertised maximum boost frequency is 3.6 GHz, however stressing a single core in most cases see the 1600 exhibit XFR-like gains hitting 3.7 GHz. So that's interesting, it seems like all Ryzen CPUs do actually feature XFR. Finally, the maximum multi-core frequency is 3.4 GHz, so that means for heavy workloads, the 1600 is clocked just 8% lower than the 1600X. Now, as I mentioned earlier, none of this really matters if you plan to have a clock, and since all Ryzen CPUs are unlocked, and the 1600 can be pushed quite hard with the Wraith Spire box cooler, certainly worth looking into. We already know though, if you don't plan to overclock, the 1600X is the faster CPU as it's clocked higher, but the 1600 is actually better value whichever way you plan to go because it can only be 10% slower and yet it's at least 20% more affordable thanks to the included box cooler and lower price tag. But when it comes time to overclock, does the 1600X offer more headroom? Rumor is that X models are bin chips capable of greater frequencies, and we have seen a little evidence of this with the 1700X and 1700 chips, though for the most part the margins were very small. The 1600X chip that I have had no trouble hitting 4.1 GHz with just 1.38 volts, and it was even possible to benchmark the system at 4.2 GHz, though that required an IO ordering 1.5 volts. AMD recommends a maximum of 1.45 volts for sustained use. Using the same 1.38 volts, the 1600 was limited to 4 GHz, which isn't bad, and increasing the voltage a fraction more to 1.4 allowed us to achieve a stable overclock of 4050 MHz, so that's just 50 MHz shy of what the 1600X managed. Of course, this could very easily have gone the other way, I just happened to receive a very good 1600X. I've seen plenty of reviewers, and now some users, limited to 4 GHz with the 1600X, so as always with overclocking, your mileage will vary. That said, I would expect almost all to hit at least 4 GHz. For single thread workloads, the overclock won't actually be any faster than the out of the box 4.1 GHz XFR performance. For multi-threaded performance, the 1600X will be up to 11% faster, while the 1600X will be up to 21% faster. That being said, let's take a quick look at some benchmarks, and I really do mean a quick look. This isn't an in-depth Ryzen 5 1600 review, in fact, it's not a review at all. That will come later, along with the quad-core 1400 model. Something I should note right away is that even with G-Skill's new Flarex DDR4 3200CL14 memory, the Ryzen 5 1600 was limited to running the memory at 2933. 
This is the same limitation we face with the 1500X, so high speed memory support is still very dependent on the CPU. This will hand the 1600X a slight advantage over the advantage it already has due to those higher clock speeds. In any case, even with DDR4 2933 memory, the 1600 was still good for a memory throughput of 35 gigabytes per second. Using Cinebench R15 to measure single and multi-threaded performance, we see that the 1600X is 10% faster for the multi-threaded test and 11% faster for the single thread test. This is about what we would expect to see out of the box. Remember, the 1600X is clocked 11% higher for single thread workloads and 9% higher for multi-threaded workloads. So these figures make sense. Here we have some results based on a real application, 7-zip. Both the compression and decompression tests use all available threads on the 1600X and 1600. Here the 1600X was around 7 to 8% faster than the 1600, so those figures are in line with what we just saw previously in Cinebench, and again, given the out-of-the-box clock speeds, these are the margins that we would expect to see. Testing gaming performance with Hitman, we find that the 1600X is just 4% faster than the 1600 when comparing either the average or minimum frame rates. Obviously not a significant performance difference, and this does explain why we didn't see any worthwhile performance gains in most games when overclocking Ryzen. Ashes of the Singularity Escalation is the only other game I tested with to compare the 1600 and 1600X. This time we see a mere 2-3% to performance advantage in favour of the 1600X, so again it looks like when it comes to gaming, spending more on the 1600X is a poor return on investment. Now when overclocking these Ryzen 5 CPUs, we find the performance is equalised. The 1600 fell just 50 MHz shy of the 1600X when using reasonable voltages. This is obviously a negligible difference, and as you can see both CPUs led the Titan X Big P to average 88 FPS. So as we suspected, the Ryzen 5 1600 is the obvious choice here. In a nutshell, for $250 US you can get the 1600X and a mostly empty box. With the 1600 though, you pay 220 US, you get a bigger box, and this time it's not empty. Inside you'll find the nice big Wraith Spire cooler. So, throw the 1600 and the included cooler on an affordable B350 motherboard, then pair it with something like G-Skills Flarex DDR4 2400 16GB memory kit, overclock the memory as high as you can, 2933 should be possible with relaxed timings, and then overclock the CPU to 4GHz and you're set. All up you have the core components for a killer 6-core 12-thread rig for no more than 400 US. Hmm, how much does Intel's Core i7-6800K cost again? Yeah, looking at it that way, the Ryzen 5 1600 is exceptional value. As I found earlier this week, even when compared to the more affordable CPUs, such as the Core i5-7600K, the new 6-core Ryzen CPUs are a much better buy, regardless of what it is you plan to do with the system. However, there's not much reason for anyone to purchase the 1600X over the 1600, as you're just paying more for less. You might be wondering then why AMD would release a 1600X type product at all, and I'd say it exists simply to maximise profit. AMD is playing a similar game to Intel here with these chips. The difference though of course being that they are doing it without completely taking advantage of enthusiasts who want to save a little money. When it comes to the 1600 you're being rewarded for doing your homework and a little tinkering. Okay, so that concludes this video. I hope it's clear now why you guys should be buying the regular Ryzen 5 1600 processor over the more flashy sounding 1600X. As I mentioned earlier, I will be covering the 1600 in more detail soon, and I'll also be checking out the budget quad-core Ryzen 5 1400 as well. The 1400 model will be compared with the Core i5-7400 and Core i3-7350K, and I might even try to throw in the ultra-affordable G4560 as well. At some point I'll also be testing the Ryzen 5 CPUs and the competing Intel chips in a wide range of games, using not just the ultra-fast GTX 1080 Ti, which does help point to future performance, but we'll also be testing with some more realistic configurations as well, using the GTX 1070, 1060 and RX 480. I also plan to revisit Ryzen memory performance. I recently checked out if Ryzen does indeed benefit from faster clocked memory. The idea really was to see if Ryzen scaled better than say KB Lake with faster memory, and the short answer is, no it doesn't. The reason I'm going to revisit this topic though is to show you guys if you actually need to spend money on the premium DDR4-3200 memory, or should you just save and get the 2400 stuff? I did see nice gains from the faster memory, but remember I was using the GTX 1080 Ti, so things might be very different with the GTX 1060 for example. Finally, I'm also working on the side to complete the second half of that is it worth buying GPU video. The first half looked at the GTX 970, while part two will focus on the R9 390. 
The results so far for the AMD GPU are very impressive, so I want to try and get that one done next week. I'll see how I go for time. No doubt a few more things will pop up in the meantime. I should also have a few board partner versions of the Mighty GTX 1080 Ti coming in the next week or so, so that's exciting. And as usual, things never seem to slow down. Alright guys, I'm going to go on and get out of here now before I think of anything else. Hope you enjoyed today's video. I'm your host Steve, I'll catch you again soon.